Hello everyone, this is Carol Byers from Bigger Ventures and I'm here to share with you all why we are subscribers to Nash and Bednet and why you should become subscribers too. Whether you're an investor, manufacturer, or service provider, there are many benefits. These two media platforms provide the most relevant resources and information in the natural products industry today. We need to stay informed of the ever-changing trends and ecosystem. And the bottom line is Nash and Bednet offer the most thorough news coverage and expertise to help support our community. In addition, Nash and Bednet provide us with an event stage, a place for us to meet up, network, commerce, and break bread. Be it virtually or in person, they bring out the best in our industry. Stay on top of your business and become a subscriber to Nash and Bednet today. Tuning into another episode of BevNet's Elevator Talk live stream. I'm Ray, Le I'm Ray Latif. Actually, I don't know who I am. I'm Ray Latif, the editor and producer of BevNet's Taste Radio podcast, the number one podcast for the food and beverage industry. Once again, Elevator Talk live stream features entrepreneurs representing some most innovative and disruptive brands from across our industry. And we're excited to hear about their news and new products related to their brands. Joining me as a co host for this episode is Vanessa Walker who is the founder of Millennial Brands Consulting. Vanessa, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you? Pretty good. That's the first time I've flubbed my name in, I think, like anything I've done. So that's a new one for me. I was going to cover it for you. If you, if you couldn't get there, I was going to jump in. <laughs> I appreciate that, Vanessa. And I appreciate it because you've been a trusted colleague of mine for many years. Uh, I remember you from back in the LaCroix days. And, uh, you know, for folks who aren't familiar with you and what you do, could you tell us a bit about your background and what you do with Millennial Brands Consulting? Sure. So um, I'm old at this point. I'm getting old. I feel old. But I've uh, been in uh, CPG and, and really beverages for over 25 years now. And uh, most recently, I was at Celsius. And that was a brand that was around for probably 10 years. Helped to turn the positioning around prior to Celsius. I was at LaCroix in the early days when it was just a very small regional brand kind of re-envisioned, re-imagined that brand. Um, was there for eight years leading the brand, 2008 to 2016. I also did a children's beverage startup. And then earlier on in my career, I was a Target stores regional buyer for beverages and foods. And prior to that, I was in the stores for four years, kind of working in retail. And that's, that's about it. That's a abridged version. Well, that abridged version is pretty impressive. Uh, retail, marketing, branding, uh, what don't you do? Um, so Millennial Brands Consulting, you know, uh, I'm familiar with the company and the firm. Um, you know, you've worked with a lot of early stage and emerging brands to scale and develop in this really competitive market. Um, you know, what are some of the priorities that you see for young brands uh, in getting to where they need to go to be successful? Yeah, it is such an important thing to understand your position, really stand for something. Sometimes we see these brands, the, the founder has a lot of passion, the package looks awesome, but it doesn't necessarily communicate any one specific thing. And when you, when you find someone and you ask them, they share their backstory, they're passionate, but to me, guiding someone through what segment of the industry are you falling into? Who are you competing against? Where ultimately do you expect the consumer to find you on the shelf? Those are all critical components of a strong foundation. And really millennial brands, my, myself, my role, uh, colleagues at millennial brands, really what I see as guiding employees of other companies is really asking them, you know, aside from what you'd hoped it would be, what are the mechanics of what you're going to find here? Are you really getting it done or are you missing? Are you clicking on all cylinders or almost getting there? Well, uh, you know, that's a lot to, uh, that's a lot to take in and it's a lot to strategize around. Um, but I have a feeling that uh, you have some great advice and thoughts and tips for the brands and entrepreneurs that are going to be speaking with today on how to get there. So thank you so much for joining us today. Once again, if you're just tuning in, this is BevNet's Elevator Talk live stream. We're going to be chatting with five entrepreneurs representing innovative and disruptive brands from across the country. 
Joining me as a co-host for this episode is Vanessa Walker from Millennial Brands Consulting. Vanessa, you ready to get to our first guest? I am. Fantastic. That first guest is Audrey Powell, who's the founder and CEO of Spice Grove. Audrey, how are you? Hi, guys. How are you? Thanks for having me on. Thank you so much for being with us. Spice Grove, love the name. What do you guys do? So I uh, create a hibiscus beverage. Um, it's a sweetened and an unsweetened flavor, um, which is pretty much all natural, made with all natural ingredients. Um, it has five ingredients, which is the hibiscus petals, ginger, uh, cinnamon, lime peel, and allspice. And it's brewed and bottled. And we have a shelf life of two years on, in this beverage with no preservative. Very cool. How long have you been on the market? I've been on the market. I launched this product two years ago, um, April of 2018, um, in the Brooklyn, New York area. I'm currently in the Maplewood, New Jersey area, but still the New York, New Jersey area. So two years ago, I started um, officially on the commercial market. And I, I've been to your website, and it looks like you do uh, a, quite a bit of direct to consumer. But where is your product sold uh, otherwise? Uh, you know, what's your retail footprint look like? Yeah, so currently we're in some dialed in retailers in the New York, New Jersey area and other places, smaller shops around the country. So um, we're in Brooklyn, we're in Manhattan here in New several places in New Jersey, a few places down in the Boston area as well, um, as well as even in the Bahamas, believe it or not, um, and Florida and North Carolina. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. A spicy hibiscus drink is how uh, it's positioned on your label. Um, right. You know, Vanessa, I'm curious as to your thoughts about the branding, the positioning of this product, particularly within um, a pretty competitive environment for super fruit drink beverages or super fruit based beverages, that is. Yeah. So first of all, congratulations. Uh, the brand looks beautiful and I see it's in glass, which is great. Thank you. Well, you know, I, I guess a question I would have, uh, it's so natural and there's so many exciting things um, and components about the brand. It's shelf stable. Um, how are you, what, what is making it shelf stable? So a hibiscus um, is extremely high acidic food and it has a very low pH um, balance. So because of those components, um, the shelf life on the product is extremely long. So we have a two year shelf life unopened. Um, once opened, of course, we ask that you put it in the refrigerator um, and it will stay in the refrigerator for another three, four months. Great. So a question, a, a burning question I have here when I look at this and I know it's shelf stable. You know, I've always believed that placement is the most educational aspect of growing your brand and explaining to the consumer who you are, why they're trying, what, what can they expect when they purchase your item? So being shelf stable, who do you consider your competitors? And if they are refrigerated, and I expect that you're going to say some that are refrigerated, how are you going to get close to them? Because you'll be placed in another unrefrigerated area. Well, that's a very good question, Vanessa. Um, based on my experience with the dialed in retailers that's carrying the product right now, they are placed in the refrigerator. Um, so they're next to that, you know, uh, green tea or iced tea or other um, drink as such as hibiscus ginger drink. So they are placed um, in the refrigerator section. Um, however, you know, in terms of grab and go, the idea also is that you could buy a six pack of these products just like you would, um, let's say seltzer, a six pack of seltzer and put it in your cupboard, right? So, I mean, it could definitely be in different um, areas of a supermarket. And if someone wants to grab and go and have something right away, it's there. But also you can have it stored um, on a shelf and put it in your cupboard or pantry. How do you explain the product, Audrey, to folks who aren't familiar with hibiscus or, you know, as it's positioned on the front of your product as Roselle? Um, okay. 
So Roselle, um, culturally, hibiscus is called different names, right? So some, when you think of hibiscus, people think it's the hibiscus in their garden. And there's over 250 species of hibiscus and probably 10,000 hybrids. So this, pro, this Roselle, um, the scientific name for it is Sabadifra, but culturally, it's called different things. I'm from Jamaica in the Caribbean. We call it sorrel. It's also known as Roselle, which is what I named the product. Um, different parts of the world, for example, the Middle East, they call it Kakaday. It's also known as Agua Jamaica. It's the same species of hibiscus. Um, this product is extremely functional. So I like to say this is a very functional beverage because you can have it as is or you could add it to your seltzer, you could make popsicles, add it to your smoothies. It makes a great mixer, whether it's for cocktails or mocktails. So it's an extremely functional beverage. And the, the, the spicy ginger taste, where it says a spicy hibiscus drink, it's a very warm taste. So it's not a spicy hot, like a pepper hot. It's more of a warm taste. So if you tend to like ginger, this is a very appeal, appealing drink. It's very balanced. Um, and as I, as I said before, very functional. Sounds like there's a lot to love. Um, I'm wondering what the price point is and how accessible these functional attributes are to the average consumer. So the price point for this drink is $6. It retails for $6. Um, and it's a 10 ounce bottle. So you can definitely get some good use out of it um, in terms of mixing it with, you know, whether you mix in it with seltzer or something else. So you can definitely get a good use out of it. Um, in terms of, um, you know, how consumer, I guess, can get this, I mean, it's, it's definitely <laughs> accessible for if you, you know, order online or, you know, if you're in the New York area as well, you can always pick this up at some of the top dialed in um, stores around town. Vanessa, we have about a minute left. Um, you know, $6 is a relatively premium price point for a, a juice beverage. Um, you know, do you think that this is something where, you know, the price has to come down before a lot of people start, you know, getting more interested in the brand or is the price point okay for its current positioning? Yeah. So I think we really need to nail down on this brand where this brand would sit on the shelf. If you're sitting next to someone else whose brand is also five, four ninety nine, five dollars, $5, you're still about a buck ahead. But if you're sitting on a ambient shelf and some of the brands are, you know, three twenty nine, two ninety nine on a single serve. You're going to be way north in terms of price point. So I think you need to nail down. You mentioned mixer, get a lot of use out of the ten ounce bottle. If you're marketing it as a multi serve or a multi pour, then maybe six dollars isn't too steep. But I'd like to see you try to work on your cogs and get that pricing in line a bit more. Um, I think that it probably needs to come down just a skosh. Okay. Thank you. Well, Audrey, uh, it was so great speaking with you. And uh, I love, as I mentioned, the name of your brand. Uh, your packaging looks great. And I look forward to trying it soon. Uh, if you have an opportunity, please send some to our office. I'd love to uh, sip Absolutely. on some Spice Grove. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me, guys. Thank nice. you so much. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Uh, that was Audrey Powell, who's the founder and CEO of Spice Grove. Uh, you know, Vanessa, you mentioned that you were formerly uh, working at, you formerly worked at Target uh, and you were talking about trying to, you know, find your best place on shelf, but it's not really up to you, right? Like where your, where your product is placed on shelf. A lot of times that's the buyer's decision uh, if, you, if you even get into the store. So, you know, how do you convince a buyer to merchandise your product and your brand in the way that you see it being most successful in store? You know, that, that's very tough because um, you have to go in and I would say you're not only selling your brand, you're really selling the category. You're selling how your brand fits into the buyer's picture of what their category is doing and how you can assist them to drive the performance in sales and margin and volume of that category. So that's key to know. And if you don't know which category you're in, and you're not sure, and you could play in many categories, you need to pick the category that you have the best chance to win, to be number one, two, or three, based on attributes, size of your package, retail price points, um, you know, 
whether or not the, the category is a high volume category. But you're right, Ray, you don't have, you won't be able to just dictate which category you're in. How about if you bring the buyer chocolates or flowers or things like that? <laughs> you could try that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, let's move on to our next guest for the uh, this episode of Elevator Talk live stream. That's Andrew Gill and Rocco Milano, the co-founders of On the Rocks Cocktails. Gentlemen, how are you? Doing well, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you know, I had some of your product. Uh, when was that? A couple of weeks ago, I want to say. Um, what was it? It was a lavender. It was a lavender uh, colored aviation. Product. It was the aviation. Yes, I'm so embarrassed that I forgot. In cocktail. That. Yes. Despite my inability to remember the name of the cocktail, I do remember how delicious it was. I was sipping at it on a Friday afternoon. It was like the greatest Friday afternoon I've had in a long time. Okay, so that's my intro to your brand. If you guys could offer an intro to what On the Cocktail, On the Rocks does and what you're all about, that would be great. Absolutely. Uh, well, Ray, I'm going to start off by saying you suggested candy and flowers. May I throw out there, candy is dandy, but liquor is quicker. So please, um, you know, deliver some booze. It, it really goes a long way. Um, on the Rocks Cocktails, we're an all-natural cane sugar sweetened and preservative-free bottled cocktail that all you have to do is pop and pour. I was a bartender for 15 years. I've worked everywhere from the beach in New Jersey to a biker bar in California to a casino in Oklahoma, down to Guatemala, and you know all points in between to a five-star hotel here in Dallas where I'm currently sitting. And what we wanted to do was come up with how we're going to recreate that bar experience for where that bartender isn't. So one of the things that we uh, really stressed initially is those types of places where people wanted a cocktail but couldn't necessarily get one. So we started with airlines and we started with uh, Virgin America that originally reached out to us uh, and said, hey, could you put together an in-flight cocktail menu for Virgin? One of our partners said, well, what if instead of just putting together a menu, what if we found a way to bottle them and, and actually sell them to you that way? So we started with airlines that quickly grew into hotels and then stadiums. Uh, event centers, places where you didn't necessarily have, you know, that carefully trained bartender and how to execute drinks. Now, obviously at a hotel, you have that. So what I would always say there is, well, maybe not for the bar, but let's talk in-room dining. Let's talk VIP amenities. At the end of the day, let's create innovation in what's traditionally a pretty straightforward category. You know, if I'm hosting my wedding there, you're going to send me a bottle of red, white, or sparkling. Well, why not send something a little bit cooler, a little bit more, uh, uh, create that more of a differential between you and some of your competitors and do something fun and do something exciting. We've now expanded that beyond just kind of uh, those focuses to retailers where we're seeing tremendous growth with uh, partners like Whole Foods, Target, grocery, just liquor stores kind of around the U.S. As people are wanting drinks delivered to them, we're seeing tremendous growth there, as well as honestly, even restaurant space. So even my initial statement of, well, we're for where the bartender's not. Well, sometimes, you know, you want to just have food delivered to you now. We're fulfilling that need as well. Outstanding. You know, one of the most interesting things about your brand is that uh, you partner with established brands, liquor brands, for each of the cocktails. So for your old fashioned, you partner with Knob Creek, for your Mai Tai with Cruz and Rum. Uh, that doesn't sound like the easiest thing to do to convince uh, a legacy brand that they should not only be uh, incorporated into your product, but have their brand logo right on the front of your bottle. How'd that happen? Um, that was definitely a, a fun journey. Um, a lot had to do with the fact that we were playing in such a different space. Uh, you know, a lot of established brands don't want to compete against themselves. So well, what's happening in the airline space? Well, people need a cocktail there. So boom, we were able to, to solve that. Once we, we started having some of the conversations with some of the big players out there of, hey, we're looking to be able to tell our guests what spirit is in there and really differentiate ourselves from anyone else by saying, hey, there's this premium quality spirit in there. Bean checked all those boxes. They had every spirit category covered. They were an incredibly engaged partner. And their production standards were just incredible. Uh, to the, and I'll, I'll go into detail. You know, one day you and I will meet up for an aviation and I'll actually go through what's actually involved in Centauri production standards, but it's food grade. I mean, for a distillery in the US to need to operate at that, that level was just crazy. So they had kind of the thought process and the focus that we did, kind of the passion behind it of how we execute. 
again, not being a guy in a lab coat that's never made a cocktail, but by someone who, who does this day in and day out, knows what these drinks should look like, what they should taste like, how they should hit the palate, how they should finish, et cetera. We wanted to be authentic to that. And Bean was on board and the quality of the spirits that they were willing to put up was just phenomenal. I mean, who doesn't know Knob Creek? To your point, that, that was just an absolutely stellar partnership. Everything in that box medaled at the San Francisco Wine and Spirits Competition, a fact that we're tremendously proud of. We have two gold, three silvers, and a bronze in that, that flight of six cocktails that we make. You know, Vanessa, uh, pre-mixed cocktails, packaged cocktails, now more relevant than ever. Um, you know, I'm curious as to your experience with this emerging segment of the cocktail category and the liquor category, um, and what you think of sort of the approach that On The Rocks has in comparison to other brands that are out there on the market? Well, I feel like, <clears throat> Ray, with this new normal, I feel like people are having probably having cocktails more so during the workday uh, than, than we even know, right? Um, I was blown away by this brand uh, in just doing research prior to this call. This brand, man, they are I'm, I'm going to take notes from them. They're, they're clicking on all cylinders, okay? Not only did I love the website, the Instagram page, the brand, On The Rocks, the name, the fact that, as, as you said, right, I mean, not only was it amazing, but the lineup, it's like an all-star lineup of cocktails. It's like the supermodels of cocktails, the Mai Tai, the Cosmo. They had everything that you'd want, and then they doubled down and got the branded liquors in there. Unbelievable. Packaging looks great. I really like what you said about the let's go places where the bartender isn't, where you don't have someone that is a professional caliber to mix the drinks. And I really think that the sky is the limit for you. I think uh, direct to consumer, I'd want to know how are you handling DTC, which is kind of this new normal. And I think what Ray was originally asking me, but I blew by that because I'm just so excited about this, this brand. Um, how are you going to get to people who want to, quite frankly, drink on the job. They want a cocktail in the middle of the day, morning, afternoon, evening, and night. How are you well, getting? I can chime in with a little bit of the direct to consumer. We, you know, as a liquor brand, we can't do e-commerce. There's amazing delivery partners out there, but it's not equal across the board for everyone's geography. So um, as a company, we take a lot of pride in our creative and we've got this amazing opportunity to create these social experiences everything from casual to kind of pushing the envelope and weird artistic stuff. And we do that because we want to reach our consumer. We want to communicate with our consumer. And so we've found a lot of success by being able to get in touch with the consumer through the social channels and then be able to actually tell that person where they can find product or assist with any questions they have. Awesome. I mean, you're, to me, your company is what being in the beverage industry is honestly all about. It's uh, two or three exciting people coming together. I like the fact that you tried not to burn down your garage, the backstory, the passion that, that's come across, the way you've approached it with this seriousness and professionalism, and you've innovated or seemingly innovated. I don't know. You know, There's other brands out there, but somehow you're doing it better to me. Um, and, and just your approach to the marketplace. I'm, I'm just blown away. This is a phenomenal brand. I praise from someone who knows a good brand. Uh, I have, there's, we have about 30 seconds left and I don't know if you can explain this in 30 seconds, but you know, Vanessa mentioned your, um, or, and Andrew, you mentioned this as well, you know, your, your social presence. You guys have 23.7 thousand followers on Instagram. That's not necessarily easy to do. Um, what's been your approach to social media and not only adding followers, but finding engaged followers? Yeah, our approach is to been constantly to continue creating cool content um, from a range of spectrum and not just running with the same, you know, the same visuals, but really kind of getting fun with it. And so we're able to use social media to kind of play some targeted ads um, and just fully use that platform to engage with the consumer. And I think just the expanse of our creative has kind of drawn its own following to kind of see what we're going to post next. Fantastic. Well, um, I hope that um, you can send samples, uh, at least to Vanessa, even though you can't necessarily ship, uh, you know, for sale, because it sounds like she is going to be a, a big fan or already is a big fan of your brand and 
to be one of those people that's uh, speaking the word, so to speak, <laughs> about On The Rocks. Uh, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us uh, on the Elevator Talk live stream. Good luck with everything going forward and please stay in touch. Thank you, it was a pleasure to be here. Pleasure. pleasure to thank you, Ray. Thank you. Uh, we ran out of time and I'm gonna ask Rocco about this offline. I don't know how he's got uh, two helmets behind him. One's a, one's a Cowboys helmet, one's a Patriots helmet. Uh, that's a story for another day, I'm sure. All right, let's move on to our next guest for this episode. And that is Harry Enche, who is the founder and CEO of RX Water. Harry, how are you? Good, very good. I'd first like to thank the, the BevNet platform, Sarah, Ryan, uh, Andrew Bray and San uh, Diego, and of course yourself, Ray, uh, for your time and, and what you guys do during this, uh, uh, this new uh, unfortunate uh, time that we're in. So uh, you really are innovators and we thank you for the time in advance. Well, Harry, I sincerely appreciate those words. Thank you so much. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not only fun and exciting to see you know, innovative brands, but hear the stories behind those brands. And that's exactly what we're trying to do here. Um, what's the story behind RX Water? Tell us about uh, the development of uh, your company. Yeah, RX Water is just an amazing story, right? Like as I'm sure all the other uh, brands out there, uh, it was really found on about three years ago, a group of scuba diver buddies, including myself. Uh, and these, you know, everyone in the group are, are physicians, everything ranging from plastic surgeon, uh, uh, urologist, cardiologist, as well as uh, dentists. And together under leadership of, of one of the doctors, for many years, they've been doing uh, philanthropic work, almost like a grassroots uh, uh, doctors without borders uh, globally. On one particular trip, uh, I was honestly angered uh, by what was going on in Flint. Uh, and obviously the group got behind me and I really had, uh, you know, passion for really tackling and not being the brand or, you know, like other companies that just donate cases and pallets. I wanted to make a real change. So my partner, David Nazar, uh, out in New York and, and I, I'm uh, in California, uh, doc, uh, back by the physicians, we, we uh, basically came up with a protocol for uh, mayor and council. Uh, to basically have the five gallon pet jug for every single household, the way that you guys get recycling bins or whatnot. And basically came up with the, the idea of putting a reverse osmosis RO system at the firehouse, which would essentially bring first responders in the community in rather than, you know, donating a case and then what. So we kind of, you know, uh, started that. We were really excited. Uh, because RX, uh, so the idea and concept, I should say, of RX was born. So we needed to create a, a, a brand and to basically shelter what our true give back uh, cause is. Um, so RX was born. Uh, it's Our trademark is medical grade hydration. We're a 9.5 pH plus BPA PET1 bottle with no fluoride, no sodium. Uh, we are backed by this, uh, the WBC, which we're very proud of, the World Boxing Council. That's the green belt that has uh, basically decorated everyone from Muhammad Ali all the way up to the Mayweathers and the Tysons of the world. It's a coveted belt. Uh, it's a great international organization we're very proud of. And uh, basically, our doctors also work with the WBC for hydration protocol because of the high dehydration in that sport uh, with regards to weight cutting and everything else. So honestly, we're really proud. Um, whoever has been on this RX uh, protocol, uh, we're basically 40 and 0 uh, throughout all the fighters that, that have been basically hydrating uh, properly uh, with the protocol set forth by our, our doctor. Um, our product line runs from eight ounce uh, we have a 16 ounce aluminum that we're a little bit ahead of the curve being from California and the change uh, that certain people are starting to move away from plastics, but we have a 24 ounce. We have a one liter as well as a one gallon with the current Kroger's deal. Since the three years and the blessings of God and, and, and the support of what I like to call the uh, RX revolution or, or our followers and, and, and supporters, 
Uh, we are basically in about 2,000 plus stores, ranging from the five boroughs in uh, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, all the way down south to Roanoke, Virginia. We have RX Midwest, which covers basically Minnesota, Wisconsin, Indianapolis, uh, 500 locations of 7-Eleven and growing up to 2,000, um, which we're really proud of uh, recently. Uh, on the West Coast, we're in about uh, 500 locations uh, covering everything from Apple Valley, Coachella Valley, now radius of Santa Monica. And <clears throat> we're now segueing into the Vegas mar market with our new product, uh, a B12 boost uh, that we have uh, to infuse in our family uh, to about 3,500 rooms at the Resorts World uh, Casino, uh, which we're very proud of. Um, with the premise of what we were founded and our give back, uh, basically we were about to announce in Flint with the mayor and council, our whole program and protocol with the Clarissa Shields fight was the greatest woman uh, heavyweight uh, known, uh, and she stems from Flint. And we had 150 children uh, that we were gonna, you know, from the community that we were gonna bring into the match and make the announcement of what we're doing. And unfortunately, that was supposed to be back in May and COVID uh, put a little pebble in our shoe, so to say. Uh, but the trajectory and the momentum of the brand is epic. Uh, and I'm really proud of what our team has done. Well, Harry, I, I love your backstory and I love hearing about the cause-based approach that RX Water is taking, uh, excuse me, RX Drinks is, well, is it, is it RX Drinks or RX Water? Because I see- It's RX, RX Water. RX Water, okay. Yeah. Um, you know, from someone who knows a thing or two about water brands, Vanessa, um, you know, RX Bar in terms, in terms of its positioning, um, you know, you can go to the website and see a lot of uh, information focused on its alkalinity. Um, you know, Harry talked a lot about the cause-based approach. What is, what is the right way to market uh, a beverage like this or a product like this? Yeah, you know, this is tricky. Um, and I didn't get a sense, whatever I looked on Google and saw and I clicked on, I didn't get as much of the backstory as you're telling me now. So I feel like more of the backstory, I didn't know why it was called medical hy hydration. And when you just explained that all these doctors were there, I, I almost wonder if there's visually a bit more that can be done here. And I think maybe that alone, you know, we're, we're in such a new normal now where people are paying attention to supplements and vitamins and what they're putting into their body and their immune system. You know, is there a reason why this is 9.5 pH plus and there's no fluoride and no, you know, is there another reason? Are you taking us to another level of uncharted waters? <laughs> yeah. No, no pun intended. Right? Explain that to us a bit more because it is an ultra competitive category. But if it came from the backing of real doctors with something that was a differentiated proposition, as a consumer, I would want to know that. And I think that's your key point of difference. But it needs to be discussed even more on your packaging and marketing. I, well, I really appreciate that, Vanessa. And uh, yeah, we do have medicalgradehydration.com. Uh, we uh, basically where the doctors speak more of the product and we're in R&D research and development uh, in our aluminum where we've partnered up with another uh, company that we're doing a immune defense uh, 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 product uh, with the base of our uh, 9.5 pH but 100% and that really will be the forefront uh, once basically, I like to say the family of products all uh, infuse and come together. Uh, but absolutely noted, your subject matter expertise is definitely uh, uh, appreciated. And uh, th that is definitely on our horizon. Uh, we were hoping more to do that launch uh, in tandem with what we, was happening in Flint with our coming out, so to say. Uh, but obviously, you know, there's some delays, but definitely on the horizon. One other quick thing, uh, you know, Harry talked about the new, it, it's a B12 shot, right, Harry? Yeah. Yeah, this uh, B12 shot that they're launching. Um, you know, if you're evolving into a platform brand where you have more than one uh, beverage uh, in your brand or that represents your brand, uh, I'm wondering, Vanessa, if you have any thoughts on how you do that in, a, in an efficient way and in a way that's going to resonate not only with your current consumer base, but the, the consumers that are uh, new and interested in your brand, either from the water or from the shot perspective? 
Yeah, so we have to decide here what's the core brand, and I guess it would be the water. And then the, the way that someone would become more introduced to or interested in your shot, there has to be a core brand, the mothership, and then you're transferring the equity into the other item in the portfolio. So I recognize the RX. I understand it came from medical doctors. It's even better for me. It's taking us to a new level in water. Ah, this RX shot must be driving at the same things produced by medical doctors. You, you have me at hello when you say medical doctors and you're telling me a B12 shot as a boost. So I think understanding and really communicating that core value, that has to be translated in the first product and then it can emanate and resonate through line extensions, which is really what you're talking about there. A hundred percent. Outstanding. Uh, basically, yeah, and exact, exactly with that, it is really tough, obviously, fighting for fruit space in certain sectors when we first rolled out. Uh, then obviously, once we caught a more traction, it became a lot easier. Uh, but with RX Boost, we didn't have to really fight for the space. And it actually became more recognizable, we noticed, because you you know, after you go to the fridge now, it's like, wait a minute, I saw that there. And oh, they're here too, uh, upon checkout. So it kind of helped a lot with a lot of our, um, uh, you know, uh, basically convenience store angle and uh, accounts that we've built. Outstanding. Harry, thank you so much. I'm sorry, Vanessa, did you want to say one more thing? I, that's what I was going to say. It's almost uh, with the power of the doctors. Uh, he may find it easier to launch the brand with that item first and then backtrack it into the waters because water is so competitive. If you've got a point of difference that lines up to tell your story better, take that as the lead off and almost get the water in there as a buy this, get that free as an introduction. Much obliged. Noted. Excellent advice. Uh, Harry, thank you so much for joining us on the live stream. Uh, really appreciate your support. And uh, please let us know if uh, you need any help with anything. Uh, we are here to help. And uh, once again, thanks so much for joining us. I'm humbled. Thank you. All right. To meet you. The same. Vanessa, you're giving some great advice and great feedback. Uh, you know, if someone wants to get in touch with you directly, what's the best way to do so? I mean, you can always find me on LinkedIn. Um, <laughs> I'm on LinkedIn. Um, and also there's the Millennial Brands uh, LinkedIn as well. And Millennial Brands Consulting. Fantastic. All right. Uh, if you're just tuning in, this is the BevNet's Elevator Talk live stream. I'm Ray Latif, joined by Vanessa Walker, the founder of Millennial Brands Consulting. On to our fourth guest of this episode, and that's Catherine, uh, Catherine Nguyen, who is the founder and CEO of Wild Will It Food. Catherine, how are you? I'm well, Ray. Thank you. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. Pretty good indeed. Wild Willet, uh, it's great. I, I, I love the name of your brand. We have our, our um, creative director, I think that's his title, um, is, his last name is Aaron Willet. His, his first name is Aaron, his last name is Willet. Uh, so I automatically love the brand because I love Aaron. Um, but I'm not too familiar with it. Could you tell us a bit about it? Sure. We originally launched in April 2019 as a healthy jerky brand for kids. And we learned a lot after uh, being in the market for six months. One of the most important things we learned that was that moms, mothers, women really liked our jerky, possibly more than our kids, their kids. So we were inspired by that and went back to the drawing board and shifted the direction of our brand. Um, we relaunched two weeks ago as a healthy high protein snack company for women. Very cool. Uh, going to your website, you have some pretty interesting flavors uh, for your beef jerky. Could you tell us about those? Sure. We launched with three fruit flavored jerkies, strawberry, orange, and pineapple. If you've tasted our jerky, it's a jerky that tastes like a treat. So think like if you, um, we've heard time and time again that our strawberry jerky tastes like a Twizzler or a jelly donut, but is a protein snack. So our nutritionals are really great. We have at least 19 grams of protein, very little sugar, no added sugar, uh, very low in carb. Uh, it's a great on the go snack. That's an innovative twist on your classic jerky. You created a beef jerky that tastes like a Twizzler or a jelly donut. <laughs> okay, that's just like a, the, a dream come true for probably, I don't know, millions of people in this world because, you know, as we all know, and no offense to, to the people who make Twizzlers and jelly donuts, there's really not a lot of nutritional value in any of those. 
So to, to have created something that actually has a lot of protein, tastes like one of those products. Well, Catherine, thank you very much on behalf of the millions that uh, want something like that. Um, why is it called Wild Willet? It's so the company was inspired and was created um, because of my three kids, Scarlett, Lily, and Will. And the reason the fruit flavor jerky came to life is because my son, who was three at the time, loved fruit snacks. And he wanted something that tasted like a fruit snack, which is why I made the strawberry jerky. But Wild Willet is an homage to them. Um, Willet is a mashup of their names. Gotcha. And they're definitely a wild crew. Uh, Vanessa, your thoughts on Wild Willet and sort of this uh, repositioning as a, a jerky brand for women? Yeah, I thought this was incredibly innovative. Um, I can't wrap my arms around what the strawberry jerky would taste like or pineapple jerky. Uh, but I had one word for you. Impossible. I guess it's two words. Impossible meats. Uh, this almost begged to me to have a line extension of a meatless jerky. So you could almost be out there with the first ever fruit meatless jerky. Um, you know, but there's a, there's a large audience for people that want to go meatless. Maybe you take a page out of on the rocks cocktails and you knock up the door on, um, impossible meats and see if they'll do a co-branded partnership with you or something. I don't know. I thought it was an interesting way to go vegan on that. You're, you're obviously appealing to females. I liked your creative, liked your Instagram page. I think a, a pineapple, you know, I mean, I, I wanted to try it. I mean, I just said, what does this smell like? What does it taste like? And beef jerky, I w I've always been attracted as a female to the high protein of the snack and the lean, low carb nature of the snack, but it just leaves me too smoky. And I always feel like I've had a bag of barbecue in a way when I didn't necessarily want one. So if you can cure some of that and serve up a lean protein as a quick snack, in other flavors, that could be really interesting for me. Thank you, Vanessa. We actually um, spoke to someone this morning who mentioned that we should partner up with Impossible Meats. So that's funny that you said that, literally. Um, and then your comment about uh, a different tasting jerky. We wanted to create something that wasn't too smoky, not too salty. Um, we've heard time and time again that our jerky tastes like a dessert, you know, and so we created a product that's bringing different consumers. We're not looking for the consumers that are currently in that category. We're looking for people that say we're not into jerky, but we love your jerky. And so one of our taglines is, you know, you don't have to like jerky to like our jerky. Um, so we're definitely trying to create our own new space. Um, and yeah, thank you for your comments. Absolutely. You know, as Vanessa mentioned, um, this is a product that you'd love to try. Um, you know, whether or not you think you'd like it or you think you'd hate it, it's something you've got to try. In the current world right now, it's pretty difficult to demo and sample. What is your approach to getting this in people's mouths? That's a great question, Ray. Um, and we've been thinking a lot about that coming into the launch. We never thought we'd be launching during a pandemic, um, but we've done, we've done a pretty good job of building, um, starting to build a community online. Um, we're working with a lot of micro influencers we are um, reaching out to just communities who are um, active women, so different categories um, and, and gifting them product and asking if they'll share their feedback online. But I think we're seeing the, the results of that. If you follow us on Instagram, you'll see on our stories, um, we'll see both organic posters and partnerships um, that we're working with. We, we have a really unique partnership with a health app called Paceline. Um, you should look it up. It's a health app that rewards you for your health fitness activity. So we're one of the rewards that's offered. Um, we've seen a lot of growth there in our sales. Um, you know, Vanessa, um, <laughs> owning a women owned business, uh, unfortunately is already, you know, puts your company at a disadvantage in so many ways in, in our food and beverage industry. We have a long way to go when it comes to supporting women owned and minority owned businesses. There are some advantages. There are some ways of, of getting that kind of support that's going to help you get off to a good start. Um, any suggestions on, you know, how Catherine can, um, you know, position her her brand in a way that's going to really amplify uh, the fact that it is woman owned and, and for women? Yeah, you know, this is going to sound like a shameless plug for Bevnet, um, and I don't mean it to to sound like this at all, but. 
you know, BevNet is a, a family. If you uh, network in through the BevNet crowd and you attend your BevNets and you see the same group of people, people look out for each other in this industry. And I think there's an opportunity to network through other women. Uh, the women are finding each other at events. I know that BevNet did something uh, in the fall of winter of 2018. We did um, kind of a women in business forum. I was on stage myself. And I had so many people come up to me after that and congregate and just kind of connect to me and reach out that we've all stayed in touch with uh, as friends. You know, I would suggest that we form, you know, even a larger group of a network of people. It's not easy. Uh, but there are more retailers now than ever that want to hear from minority businesses. So you certainly have, you know, the, the tide has turned there. I think the traditional routes to market might be a little bit more difficult, but if you're not going DSD and you're uh, not to say anything negative about DSD, but there are less women in DSD. Um, but I think the playing field is pretty even and pretty wide open today at retail to accept a female owned business and to maybe even give you an opportunity to get in the door under, maybe they take a certain percentage. I know Southeast Grocers takes a certain percentage of minority owned businesses every year and you find those and knock on the door and get in through the right programs and they will help shepherd you. Excellent advice and thank you for that plug. I appreciate it. You know, as much as it is, uh, you know, promoting BabNet, it is true, um, you know, the community that we have in the community within our industry is really strong. It's just, you've got to knock on the right doors and uh, find the right people to network with. Um, and I think, you know, Vanessa hit the nail on the head when she said that um, we're a supportive industry. It's just about, you know, making those initial connections. Catherine, uh, thank you so much for sharing the story uh, of Wild Will with us. Uh, good luck with everything going forward and uh, can't wait to try your brand or your thank products. You. Thank you. Thank you. Call impossible meets. Good luck. <laughs> Thanks, Vanessa. <laughs> All right. Uh, you know, interesting stuff. Like the, the idea that a beef jerky could taste like a Twizzler is just so uh, mind blowing right now. I, I love that idea. I love, it. I love Twizzlers, but I've sworn off Twizzlers. It's true. Oh my gosh. And jelly donuts. And jelly donuts. Yes. Sure. Clearly, we're clearly we're, you know, candy and snack people, Vanessa. This is probably why we get along so well. I know. <laughs> All right, on to our final guest for this episode of BevNet's Elevator Talk live stream. We have, all of a sudden I lost my, oh, there it is. Catherine Barrel, who is the founder and CEO of Reblend. Catherine, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for your patience. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's always, I'm sure, kind of difficult to sit and you know, wait to, to speak about your brand, but uh, I'm really interested to hear about Reblend. Uh, what do you guys do? Yeah, Reblend is a line of frozen smoothie pops packed with impact. We are a smoothie shortcut that allows you to squeeze the good stuff in. And we work with to the Reblends. Um, we work with farmers and manufacturers to offload unnecessarily discarded produce via our reharvest and repurpose platform and encourage consumers to rethink the way they eat via our ability to work with nutritionists to craft functional blends that use high impact ingredients like baobab and kamu kamu and coconut water. Reblend began in my kitchen. I was tired of my kitchen turning into a war zone every single morning. I had ingredients all over my counter. I was tired of produce going bad, so I'm throwing it into the freezer. Every morning I'm opening up the freezer. Ingredients are falling on my feet. And I had this idea of taking a smoothie, distilling it, stripping out all the bulk, the fruit, the excess fruit, the water, all of the ice, and pack it into a super efficient, fun, frozen pop. And really, Reblin began selfishly as my own smoothie hack. I started to make them for myself. My friends started to see me eat them, asked me if I would make them some, offered to pay me to make them some. And quickly I realized that I had something on my hands and that not only was I targeting my own desire to find an efficient way to get the good stuff in, that this could also be a really powerful platform to go after a lot of the inefficiencies I saw taking place within the food system. So year one, graduated from school, 
moved the business to Colorado, found a co-packing facility that let me come during the off hours. I was working 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. I had bought my own equipment and I was hitting all of the local farmers markets, mom and pop shops, country clubs, all of which gave me the data to understand what was working, what wasn't working, where I needed to tweak the recipes and our packaging and have made a relaunch uh, with all that information and experience in hand. Amazing stuff, uh, really innovative to create a smoothie shot. I think, are you the only smoothie shot on the market? To my knowledge, um, you know, there very well might be someone out there that I have yet to discover, but I've done a decent amount of combing and have found that we really are bringing a unique and innovative offering to the marketplace. Uh, and, you know, innovative is certainly a way to, to describe your brand. Um, and I ask about others out there because uh, what do they say? It takes a you know, rising tide floats all boats or, you know, it helps to have competitors in your category if you have a category, um, how is this product merchandised? I mean, how do you how do you position it on shelf? I mean, in terms of positioning it in, when you think about the functionality, a really great proxy that I have found hits home with a lot of consumers is when you talk about a nutrient shot or a wellness shot, where there is that high focus on efficiency of getting a lot in and a small pouch. Um, in terms of where we show up, We've also always been really focused on looking at sales platforms that can double as marketing platforms. So for example, we launched at Pure Bar Studios, knowing that you know it kind of sidebars that question around the traditional brick and mortar uh, merchandising. And additionally, it gave us an opportunity to share our story and our brand in a way that we would never be able to buy that attention in a grocery store. Um, similarly, when you know we look to launch at country clubs on the golf course or hotels for their catering and events, we are consistently going after occasions where we are looking at captive audiences that are able to interact with our product, spend an extra minute, two minutes looking and understanding and reading on our packaging about who we are and really the focus for years one and two is outside of the traditional brick and mortar uh, grocery store, knowing that there is a really big opportunity for us to drive our brand awareness and a lot of those velocities to make a transition into grocery a uh, more successful one. And to be able to deliver a lot more of the category answers that we know the buyers are going to be seeking out. Vanessa, you know, um, Catherine talked about building awareness for the brand uh, in non-traditional retail and scaling into brick and mortar from there. Um, what are the opportunities and the challenges in doing so? Yeah, you know, I, I think that thinking outside the box like that is very helpful and realizing that if I can get to a place that's a marketing and sales opportunity, it's a great opportunity. I agree with that. Smart approach. Let me ask this, is your product frozen or is it refrigerated in terms of where it would sit in a grocery, a traditional grocery setting? So the products ship ambient and are frozen on site. So if you were to think about a traditional brick and mortar grocery store, we would live in the frozen set. That's really the use is frozen. And that's really how we want to communicate via where we would show up. Um, but from a transit and a freight and kind of a behind the scenes perspective, our product ships and moves ambient. And does that movement, uh, the logistics ambiently, does that um, affect the shelf life? In other words, could you be ambient until someone took, took you home and then froze you? Absolutely. Yeah, and the ambient has also been a really powerful way for us to get legs into sales channels that we might otherwise not be able to access. So for example, um, we just launched on Sunbasket and by way of them being able to ship us ambient, we're able to get inserted into their platform and their boxes and consumers can freeze us at home. Okay. What is, what is the, I'm sorry, Vanessa, go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say, if you wanted to gain, let's say a main aisle display, 
you wouldn't really be able to do that in a grocery store frozen. So if you have the ability to ship ambient and, um, you know, you could be ambient in stores and then frozen before serving at home or using at home, give I don't know what the logistics on that shelf life is. I don't know if there's some kind of time component there, but I would say that's your best bet. I mean, it, it might not be a bad idea to have um, an area in frozen as well, but if I'm the frozen buyer and I might be able to do something outside of frozen to attract people to come into the cold cabinets, that's a very powerful thing because I don't know of any other frozen brands that have that dual zone, climate zone capability. And I would actually really think about that hard in terms of merchandising and sales for this brand. Absolutely. Thank you. You know, uh, I could take a guess at who your target consumer is, but it's probably just easier to ask you, um, who is your target consumer and what do they care most about? Is it the superfood component? Is it the upcycling component? Is it the fact that it can be on the go? Um, you know, what are you, what are you sensing? You know, the umbrella of who we go after is a consumer that understands the role that nutrition plays in achieving their primary goals. You know, that's the, the high level. In terms of who that looks like, um, we have really focused on initially busy professionals that are time strapped or oftentimes finding themselves in captive environments like hotel conferences, post-workout gyms, the office break room where they don't readily have the ability to have a blender and all of their ingredients to get the good stuff in. Um, in terms of kind of the way it continues to manifest and what we're seeing in market is we're seeing there is a broader response. We're seeing moms gravitate to reblends. Um, we've heard quite a bit that kids are loving the pops and moms are thrilled that they're not having to fight with their kids to eat vegetables. Um, and so there is a broader uh, audience, but in terms of who we really focus on from uh, ingredient and recipe formulation, in terms of where we are trying to show up, our North Star really is that time-strapped consumer that recognizes the value of nutrition. Um, to answer your other question of how do we begin to start piecing together a lot of the values that we bring to the table, one of the things that I knew in building this brand is that I really care a lot. I could talk for quite an extended period of time around my passion on tackling food waste, but I never fool myself into thinking that that will be the dominant reason that someone might make a purchasing decision. And so I knew from the very get-go that function had to be the lead factor with how we merchandise and marketed the brand. Consumers need to know that there's a benefit to purchasing it. Um, the second is taste and that actual flavor experience. You, know, you can fool someone once to purchase your product. You're not going to get them to buy it again if they didn't enjoy the taste and that experience. And the third piece, you know, when you look at the hierarchy is delivering on a mission that people are excited to talk about, that they feel really good about making the purchase, you know, similar to a North Face versus Patagonia decision that someone might have, they might opt to choose the Patagonia because they understand what that purchase means and really where that brand is investing their dollars. And so that's how I look at syncing up all three of the different values and how I try to optimize our packaging and our messaging accordingly. Well, the, the function is, comes off uh, loud and clear on the front of your package, very blow, very, very glow, frosé, all day chill, tropical bliss recover, and my personal favorite, your daily detox. Um, after the on the rocks cocktail, a little reblend, you know, of your daily detox, kind of <laughs> the way I'm going with this. Um, you know, we're, we're out of time, but I have one important question to ask, and I'm sure this is a question that will, you know, resonate or uh, relate to a lot of other entrepreneurs. Um, you said you went and bought your own equipment to help produce this product. Uh, are you still producing it on your own or you, do you have a co-packer? And, uh, you know, I haven't seen this packaging format in a, you know, in a lot of brands. So if you do have a co-packer, <laughs> you know, how do you navigate that relationship? Yeah, well, I will say the self-manufacturing journey, um, 
it was clunky. Like it was not a glamorous experience. Um, you know, I have a history working in the food industry. So I did have enough confidence in my ability to execute on a food safe product. Um, but quickly found that the order sizes that we were getting in were far larger than anything I could spend, you know, my time being able to keep up with. And so we did make a transition to a co-packer and that has been hands down one of the most daunting parts of the experience, you know, not only as kind of a female entrepreneur breaking into a sector of the food industry that historically has been you know, very male dominated. Uh, additionally, it's, it's difficult to be a very firm advocate for your brand. I have a lot of guardrails around how the product is produced. There are a lot of, you know, shortcuts that a lot of people have encouraged me to make along the way. You know, we only use whole ingredients. Um, I've been encouraged time and time again to just use concentrates or just to use, you know, flavoring for some of our ingredients and I never will. And that's made this journey that much more daunting. But I think having a very clear vision of what we are willing and not willing to do and being relentless and knocking on every single door, knocking on it multiple times and being able to bring to the table a consumer base that we know are really passionate about our products and to being able to bring to the table a lot of customers that want to purchase the products have given us a lot of the fuel to continue pushing on those relationships. You know, I think you made Vanessa's day uh, because she got more and more happy with each word that you were saying. I think, uh, Vanessa, any any last uh, thoughts on, on Reblend and what Catherine was just talking about in terms of her uh, passion and hustle for the brand? Yeah, I mean, listen, you you took on the whole world when you took on a complicated uh, produce, frozen, you you know, kudos and hats off to you. And certainly walking into that co-packer on the midnight shift is seemingly daunting. Uh, I think you're going to go far here. I think that logistics, if you've got that conquered, really look into the shelf stable aspect. I think that's, that's a great way to expand the brand and watch the financing. Um, because I think a brand like this is going to, you know, it's a great brand and I don't want it to fall on the sword. I want to make sure you've got the financing in play. And as a female entrepreneur, sometimes that's also the next daunting thing, right? So good luck there. And um, I think you got a great brand. Thank you. That's Thank you great. very much. Catherine, uh, so great uh, talking to you today. Uh, please stay in touch. Um, and you know, as I mentioned to one of the other entrepreneurs, if you need anything, please reach out. We're here to help in any way we can. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Well, that was, a <laughs> man, you know, every time we do one of these, I'm just more and more impressed by the entrepreneurs that we see and the diversity of the brands and products that we're, you know, seeing come to market and the ones that are already out there. You know, Vanessa, I'm curious as to your thoughts on, you know, what we heard and, and, and saw from entrepreneurs today. And just in general, what you think um, they should really be focusing on. I know you talked about this at the top of the show, but you know, looking back on what we what we just uh, saw and heard, um, what do you really want to drive home to those uh, those entrepreneurs and the ones that are watching at home? Yeah. So make sure that you understand exactly where you're going to make your profit dollars. Understand where you're going to be able to play to win, and what winning means to you. Who are your competitors? Who is your target audience? And how do you communicate? your true core value and proposition to them. A lot of passion out there, different levels of learning, different levels here on this call today of um, you know, how far along the brands have progressed. I think we see some real, real winners here with opportunities to go very far. And uh, wow, it is so competitive out there. Look at all these new great entrants and I'm glad they found their way to the BevNet platform so that we could chat with them today. And a lot of things I need samples of. Apparently, you've been dipping into the aviation uh, a little over there. No wonder you forgot your name at the top of the show. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Vanessa, I think you're, uh, you're probably 100% right about, uh, you know, cocktails during the day, during the work hour. Maybe I should be laying off that. No, in all seriousness, I don't do that. 
but I can understand why uh, I might want to have an aviation on the rocks. Perhaps, you know, for, perhaps this will become that kind of show where you like in the, you know, like in the old days where you can have a cock, like, you know, yeah. the Jerry Garson show, the Tonight Show, you're having a cocktail while you're on the talk show. Now I'm like, I'm really going off the rails here. All right. Uh, you know, Vanessa, I sincerely appreciate you being able to join us today. You offer just such a wealth of wisdom, feedback, and advice to entrepreneurs. I hope folks get in touch with you, um, not only the ones that appear on the show, but the ones watching as well. Just once again, uh, LinkedIn is the best way to do it. Just linkedin.com slash Vanessa Walker. <laughs> Yep. Contact me on LinkedIn. And also you could go to millennial brands, uh, consulting us. That's our website. Fantastic. Me, Ray. Thank you as usual. So great seeing you. I hope I get to see you in person soon. Uh, but until then, uh, it's so good to chat with you and hope we can do that again, uh, in the near future. You want to come back on the show, right? I do. Of course. Oh, fantastic. I'd love to have you back on the show. Uh, well, my favorite. Thank you all so much for watching and tuning in. Uh, we're on every Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, signing off for fantastic Vanessa Walker and our amazing team at BevNet and Nosh. I'm Ray Latif. We'll talk to you next time. Carol Byers from Bigger Ventures, and I'm here to share with you all why we are subscribers to Nash and BevNet and why you should become subscribers too. Whether you're an investor, manufacturer, or service provider, there are many benefits. These two media platforms provide the most relevant resources and information in the natural products industry today. We need to stay informed of the ever-changing trends and ecosystem. And the bottom line is Nash and BevNet offer the most thorough news coverage and expertise to help support our community. In addition, Nash and BevNet provide us with an event stage, a place for us to meet up, network, commerce, and break bread. Be it virtually or in person, they bring out the best in our industry. Stay on top of your business and become a subscriber to Nash and BevNet today.